Hey, Liz, it's great to see you today. Thanks for joining me. Isn't this fun that we can meet this way? This is so cool. I love it. It's like we're, you know, together, even though we're not. So I love working with you. I love seeing your face. So this is really exciting for me to have this opportunity to interview you um, because you're one of my, you know, idols in this field, which is really great. Um, I'm so fortunate to have the opportunity to collaborate with you and to work with you on a new class series that we're going to be talking about today, but also just to interview you from behind the scenes of what Liz Lipsky does and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and what she thinks about the microbiome. So we're here to talk mostly about your career as a leader in digestive wellness. So I have to ask, what really, you know, brought you to, uh, to this field to study not just nutrition, but really focusing on, you know, digestive health. I really want to know what inspired you to do this. <laughs> when I was in college, I started reading Ewell Gibbons books, and they were about stalking the wild asparagus and stalking the wild blue oyster. They were about foraging for food. And that was really my first entree into the world of nutrition. And that led me into being uh, somebody who started studying herbal medicine on my own. And when I graduated college, I started teaching classes in herbal medicine. And then one day, you know, that kind of light bulb thing that, ha that they say happened actually happened. It was like, whoa, epiphany that herbs are magical and brilliant and amazing, yet that they, they are not foundational. And then what people really need that's foundational for health is laughter and friends and a sense of mm. meaning and purpose and good food and sleep and movement. And that that's really the foundation of health. And so at that point, I decided to switch into nutrition. And um, so that's how I got started in nutrition. I also think that my mom was an amazing cook and she mm. loved to cook and she, I would watch her cook and I would help her cook from a very young age. And I think that that really influenced me as well um, in terms of a love of food and a love of nutrition. Mm -hmm. As far as getting into digestion, in the early 1990s, I started going to these conferences when some of the functional medicine testing labs were brand new. And um, because that's how we had to learn back then. There weren't any schools. We had to go mm -hmm. to conferences. And so I would go to conferences and I would learn. And so much w was on dysbiosis and leaky gut. And these were brand new concepts back then. And mm -hmm. I was then working with this doctor and he showed me the first stool test I'd ever seen. And he mm -hmm. managed to say, these tests are going to change all of internal medicine. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, I want to know more about this. So I went to actually at the very first functional medicine conference ever in um, Maui in the early 90s. I talked with Stephen Barry, who was the uh, president and founder of what's now Genova Labs. Mm -hmm. It was Great Smokies Labs back then. And I said to him, I'd like to write a book on dysbiosis and leaky gut syndrome and digestive system because it seems like this is really core to health. And he said, wow, we really need somebody to do that. And um, so he sent me like cassette tapes of all of the lectures they'd ever done. And PubMed was brand new then. I had to actually pay for every single search that I did. Wow. Um, and Yet, I was able to really kind of tease out and figure out what was really going on and look at all that. And that was the birth of my book, Digestive Wellness. And uh, it was pretty exciting to be able to do that and to, and to put that together. And that got me off and running. I wasn't really an expert. I knew more than a lot of other people, but I wasn't really considered to be an expert at that point. But what happened is it started attracting all these clients to come see me hmm. from all over the country and all over the world who had problems that weren't getting addressed in, in the care that they were getting. And then pretty soon I became somebody who knew quite a lot about this area. 
And uh, now my book, I'm working on a fifth edition of it. Um, oh, refining. wow. Although I'm reading the fourth edition and going, this is a good book, you know, as I'm writing it. <laughs> it's a great it. book. <laughs> For anybody that hasn't picked it up, it's a great book. So I highly recommend you, you take a look at that. A lot of the content, you know, that foundational piece is covered you know, in the courses that we're going to be talking about. But the book itself is just a great resource for anybody. And I myself, I think, um, I've I've shared quite openly on, you know, my bio and kind of what I talk about. But I've, you know, digestion has been kind of an issue for me for, you know, a long time. It's something I continue to try to um, manage. And I think that um, when you have those problems, people don't, understand how disruptive it is to one's life and well-being and to have like solutions you know when I went to a conventional practitioner like talking about leaky gut they were like what are you talking about so you have to phrase it in the right way right but um you know I think a lot of this is becoming more mainstream and I think that's you know from people like you who are out there, you know, continuing to take a more clinical and research-based and academic focus to this instead of it just being, you know, woo-woo ideas, right? It's really, I think, becoming more mainstream. That's my perception um, in the whole space. And I guess that's kind of where my next question leads is that from what I understand, I haven't been through your, your journey, but, um, you know, I do think that you may have faced some challenges about being accepted into that paradigm, perhaps throughout your career, um, and so you know, how have you seen that change from, you know, that holistic focus to permeating more of that conventional focus and kind of being that integrative piece? How you can synergize the two? Have you seen some evolution and acceptance and growth of people being fascinated about the microbiome? Because I certainly feel like I have. I do. I think it's not only the microbiome. I think that the advent of the internet has really changed everything. It's mm-hmm. put it's put everything into the person's hands. So you start having symptoms or you don't feel well. The first place you look is online rather than calling your doctor's office. And yeah. it's just a new way of of doing self care. People have always done self care. You get a headache. What's the first thing you do? You go, oh. Am I dehydrated? Oh, I didn't drink enough water today. Let me drink water and see if that's why I have a high a headache. Or, oh, I have a headache. Huh, have I been eating enough greens? Have I been getting enough magnesium? Maybe I'll take a magnesium supplement. Mm-hmm. Or, or um, oh, maybe I'll just take a Tylenol or, a, or an Advil or an aspirin um, for that headache. People have always done, we always do self-care and now we do so much more. And I think that the reason for for that, I was just at a conference earlier this week and had lunch with some physicians. And, you know, the way medical school is taught and the way medicine is practiced is really designed for people who have acute health care issues. Right. So if you've got an infection, you really want an acute solution. I have a, an infection. I need an antibiotic. I want to deal with that. Or, oh, I broke my leg. I want an acute solution. Right. I need a cast. Exactly. And and what happens is that what how medicine is practiced quite a lot these days is that you walk in and you go, well, I have continuous heartburn, and so you get put on um, a proton pump inhibitor, yep. Yep. which blocks acid production, and then you feel better. Okay, and so you worked with the symptoms and you feel better. And so you go in every six months or whatever, or every year, and your doctor just refills the prescription. So we have a chronic problem that's being treated in an acute model. Right. Instead of saying, well, let's give you this drug and then let's try to figure out what else in your life may be contributing to this heartburn that you have Mm -hmm. and let's see if we can get that under control so then in six or 12 weeks we can wean you off of this medication and um, so I think that's really where medicine is going and even the way that Medicare and insurance models are looking at cost savings they're starting to look at 
well, what's really the outcome? And we're starting to start to see a balance in policy even that says, wait a minute, we've been focusing on disease. Let's focus Mm -hmm. on all the things about Liz or Beth that are actually working really great in their Mm -hmm. life. Okay. Because, you know, like you or I are more than our heartburn. You know, I mean, maybe our energy is really great. Maybe we're really great moms or we do really good jobs at work or maybe we have really great other relationships. We are so much more than the sum of this symptomology that we have. And so... Um, I think that medicine is starting to look at how can we really move, work on what's right in people and enhance what's right rather than focusing on all the things that are wrong. And um, it, it's a fascinating topic. It's, uh, I was at a conference this, this week, as I said, and one of the questions was, what do you want your health for? Like, what's mm. that purpose? Really, what's that purpose? And what we want our health for is the same reason that we want our, our to be alive. It's we want to experience joy. We want to have yeah. good relationships. We might have a goal of, boy, there's a mountain I'd like to climb. Or right. I really, you know, I'm a good pian- pianist, but I'd really like to be able to perform publicly or have an art show or Whatever it is, or see my grandchildren grow up. Right. I was just going to um, think of that one. Yep. Play with your grandkids, right? Yeah. You know, whatever it is, it's like we all have to find kind of our why that motivates us and says, mm-hmm. why do I work consistently on developing healthful habits when the old habits are so much easier and mm-hmm. apparently seem like more fun because it's what we're used to? And it and I have to say, I know a lot of people think like eating well is not fun, but eating well is just as much fun as eating junk food was. Right. Exactly. Once you, once you make small changes to get there and yeah. it's right. Exactly. So that's interesting. I love that positive approach to health and that there's places for, that's what I always say. I mean, there's places for acute care. We all need that when you break a leg. Right. But then there's that you know, what is the root cause? So we can try to work towards that just an optimal, you know, well-being. So we don't have to take all that medicine perhaps one day, or maybe we do, but we'll still be able to supplement with other strategies that improve our health overall. So um, that's why I was so excited to work with you on this series. I'm really, um, you know, really anxious to put it out there to the world and kind of capture all this great knowledge that you have for everybody. Um, the series that we've developed is a masterclass series with an expert yourself. Um, it's called Balancing the Microbiome. And so I think this is a really amazing opportunity for both integrative health practitioners, but anybody really who's in healthcare or just anybody who's interested in learning about this topic to um, really find some of those integrative solutions to optimal living and well-being um, and kind of learn from your extensive knowledge that you've accumulated all over the years, right? It's like a expert, you know, course from Liz, one of the, you know, pioneers in this field. And you are one, um, continue to be one, obviously. Um, so this series, we have four classes. Um, it's called the Human Microbiome and Health is the first one. So we kind of lay the stage and you can talk a little about each of these, but then we have the gut and micro, the gut and cardiometabolic health, if I can say that in one sentence. Um, we have the gut brain connection because that is huge. I've learned a lot about that from my own personal experience. And then this one's really fascinating to me um, from the perspective of food as medicine, but we have utilizing food and lifestyle to enhance the microbiome in health. So that's somebody who is in pretty good health, but how can we enhance that? And then we also have utilizing therapeutic dietary approaches to balance a disordered microbiome. So there are stages to that process, right? So um, would you like to talk a little about any of the highlights there that you think are really important pearls of wisdom or nuggets that people can expect without giving it all away, um, you know, just for a high level overview? Sure. Well, first of all, I think it's really important to just start talking a little bit about what's the microbiome and why do we even care about it? Yeah. And for me, what's fascinating that this story that's unfolding, and we're really just in like chapter two 
of like a 20 page volume, a, a 20 chapter volume here. Mm -hmm. um, so when we start looking at the microbiome, well, what is it? It's the collection of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live symbiotically with us. And what's fascinating to me is that the latest research shows that we have just in, and this microbiome lives like on your skin and yeah. in your eyes and in your nose and in your digestive system and in your genital urinary system and in your lungs. And what I um, strongly believe, and we haven't really started seeing analysis of these yet, but I had another one of those epiphany moments a couple of years ago, is that we're going to start learning about the microbiome of the liver and the pancreas mm. and and the heart and the brain. And so, for instance, um, we found now there's a new hypothesis in Alzheimer's research. And because we know that in Alzheimer's, in the Alzheimer's brain, you've got what's called um, tau protein and these and these um, beta amyloid proton, uh, protein and then these tangles, neurofibratory tangles. And it appears that, that they are a protective mechanism against inflammatory microbes in the brain is one of the theories, one of the many theories of, of uh, why people get Alzheimer's disease. And wow. so... So we're starting to look, and when the Human Microbiome Project was begun in 19, uh, 2006, mm -hmm. uh, 2008, um, they didn't even think to include the lungs. Mm. So this is all really new. In the last 10 years, this area has just been exploding. And what the microbiome does is it helps regulate metabolism and blood mm -hmm. sugar, whether you're fat or thin, whether you're happy or depressed. Yeah, that's really fascinating, right? The mood connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. in this course, we're going to kind of focus on what is the microbiome, where is it, and then how does it modulate different parts of our overall health? And so I chose some areas that I thought were really pivotal in terms of looking at cardiometabolic disease. Mm -hmm. So we know that, for example, heart disease is rampant in our yeah, culture. Right. Also cardiovascular disease rampant in our culture. And then a lot of people are kind of on their way to one of those. So we hear a lot of people mm -hmm. saying, well, I'm pre-diabetic or I'm, or gee, my glucose levels just kind of keep going up every year just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the time to start looking at that? Right. Or my cholesterol's high, or my triglycerides are high, or my blood pressure's high. So we want to start kind of looking at how does the microbiome actually work there? And some of the kind of key nuggets is that we're finding that, wow, a disordered microbiome is a driver of a lot of this imbalance. Yeah. And so when we start to see fatty liver disease, or we start to see some of these issues that kind of predispose us towards diabetes or heart disease, what's the microbiome? What role is the microbiome playing there? Um, then we also are starting to get a lot of data. In fact, really interesting, you know, so often I'll put somebody on, I'm not in practice anymore, but when I was, um, I'd put somebody on a special diet and I'd say, you know what, let's put you on this special diet. And not only their GI issues would resolve, but also they would find, discover that they had better energy right. and that they were happier and that they could think more clearly. And we see this over and over and over in practice. I remember a client that I had who came in to see me and she wanted to lose weight was her main issue, but she also had so much pain in her muscles and in her joints. Mm -hmm. that she could barely walk. And so we tried um, a diet called a comprehensive elimination diet, mm -hmm. and she went on it. When I looked at her food plan, it was basically pastries and ice cream was the mm -hmm. bulk of what she liked to eat every day. Mm -hmm. And so I said, no dairy, no gluten-containing grains, no sugar, no soy, no eggs. We, and we're going to have you just eat really cleanly. 
And within two weeks, she had lost some weight, but also her pain was gone. And within four weeks, she was starting to really feel better. She was on five um, mental health medications when we started. And within a matter of six or eight weeks, working with her psychiatrist, she was down to two medications. And what was so fascinating was that every once in a while, she'd go back to her old patterns. And then all of her, all of her yeah. pain would come back and her mental health issues would come back. And it wasn't until after the third time, I said, you know, this is the third time that this has happened. And um, so this is in your hands. It's kind of like a faucet you can turn on and off, on and off. So you're never going to be perfect at it. But look at this is in your hands and we can see this every time. And she's not unique in what we discover nope. about this. Right. Um, and so it's great. We're gonna, right. Well, yeah. I was say, just go ahead, finish what you were saying. I don't mean to interrupt you. I just got very excited by that, <laughs> that whole, yeah, you know, when you, see, when you see that, those results and, um, you know, I've seen throughout experimentation, um, you know, as a health coach, you know, I provide people with your book as a resource and, you know, we can kind of go through that step-by-step -step process. And that's some of the stuff that you're going to cover as well in this course is really, what are some really targeted approaches that you can you know, take, and it doesn't take much time to see those improvements, right? And it's really, like, that's the motivation people need, right? It's like, well, at first, you might not really want to do it, but then when you start to feel better, then it's like, all right, well, I'm going to stick to this. And I've had my mom, you know, my dad, like, all these people in my life who are, you know, completely shun all of this stuff normally, but they're kind of trying to help other people now. So we're one by one, you know, you kind of are saying, teaching people how to do something, but then they're telling other people. So it's just kind of spreading, you know, it's the, exciting. right. It's so great. And you're right. It's not, it, it may seem at the surface, um, you know, like a lot, but when you break it down, it, it makes sense and how food and lifestyle and, you know, our bodies are meant to thrive. So if we're not taking care of ourselves, then why would we expect, you know, to feel great? Right. Um, yeah. So you've had so many amazing probably experiences throughout your career. Now you're teaching others in this phase, how to actually help others. So that's really great that you're giving back in that way. Um, did you want to say anything else about the things you're going to talk about in the courses? Because I know we don't want to give everything away, but I don't want to cut you off there either. So, well, you know, one of the what we know from the research is that the easiest way and the fastest way to change the microbiome is through diet. So we're going to really focus a lot on what does a good diet look like, and that the the details of that are different for everybody. Yeah. But the bulk of that is really a whole, almost all whole foods diet where you're eating real food. And um, according to the U.S. government, the average person in this country eats about 70% of their food as highly processed nutrient stripped mm -hmm. food. So that's a first level and if somebody doesn't ever come to this class that would be good advice right. for all of us to do and so we're going to look at kind of what are the things that a diet has in common whether it's a vegan diet or a paleo diet and and how does that look and how does that interact and what do we know about how diet affects the microbiome the second thing is that a lot of people have GI issues. In fact, most people, more than half of all people, have some kind of GI upset within a three month period. And so why, how can we work to rebalance that? And how can we use diet to really do that? So we'll be looking at various dietary approaches from the comprehensive elimination diet, the FODMAP diet, specific carbohydrate diet, and others to really kind of think about, well, how do I bring the microbiome back into balance with food and try to get people excited about doing that? Um, so it's, it's a cool time. And, you know, when I first started studying nutrition, nutrition was back in the 1970s, long time ago, 40 years ago, 
nutrition didn't play any kind of center stage in healthcare. And I'm excited to say that nutrition is finally kind of reach the public consciousness, not only about, wow, does it taste good and can I get a hold of it? Yeah. But um, what's it really doing in my body? Because food is really medicine. And so how can we really explore that? So so we're going to kind of look at all of this in a lot of depth and look at the research so that people really understand that it's not just information I'm making up. Right. And and um, look at the research, look at a synthesis of that research, and then start diving into, okay, how do we really do it from a nutritional approach? And um, there's so much that we can do. And probably most of the people listening to this have made some kind of dietary change in the last five years. And they've noticed from that change, either it helped them and they stuck with it, or it helped them for a while, so they stuck with it for a while, and then it didn't seem to be the true answer, or that they did it for a while, and then they forgot about doing it and went back to their old habits. And so, you know, it's, um, I think the more we know, the easier it is to really build lifelong habits. And hopefully, um, the clinicians who come to this conference, it'll give them another lens to add to their already full toolbox on how to approach people in from a different way and how to think about it from a different way. And the people who come because they're learning for themselves or for family members, I think will come away with lots of practical information and tools so that they can do this themselves. Amazing. I'm, I'm really just excited about, you know, putting this together and um, you talked so much about the things I was going to ask you, and I know I could interview you for another two hours or more, and, you know, maybe we'll have you back as we do more, you know, things together, but um, just final little nuggets. You talked a little bit about some of the, um, you know, things that are coming out in the future, some more innovative things we might be seeing. I know I've been seeing a lot more of this personalized even probiotics right we're actually getting to test people can test their own microbiome you know they can order home tests and do really neat things with that and um you know what are some things that you are really excited about about the future of this topic of nutrition or digestive wellness that you think that people should be looking out for I think that there's a, a lot of different areas. One, we're going to find that not only food affects the microbiome, we're starting to get early research on exercise, mm -hmm. also enhancing the microbiome, sleep, um, meditation. We ha don't have the, uh, these yet, but I think we're going to see that, that all the things we know that are really good for us are also good for our microbiome. Yeah. And and so we're going to be seeing a lot more of that research. We're also going to be experimenting a lot more with something called a fecal transplant, mm -hmm. which is basically um, you take the poop from somebody who's healthy and you give it as an enema or even sometimes as pills to somebody who mm. has inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or somebody who has um, recurring um, Clostridium difficile, which is an infection mm -hmm. and uh, that causes copious amount of diarrhea and people actually can die from it. Yeah, and that's um, really prevalent, already... isn't it? It's, be, it's more common than people imagine, I've, I've, I've heard and read. It, it is, and it also spreads like wildfire. So yeah. you see it in hospitals, people pick it up in hospitals, people picking up in nursing homes. And wherever you've got people who are kind of frail or, or you know, uh, susceptible, you see getting passed around um, mm -hmm. quite a lot. And right now, this fecal transplant is the accepted therapeutic for people who have recurring Clostridium difficile, people hmm. who've had um, antibiotic treatment a couple of times. Um, because we know that it's more than 90% effective. And so this is the treatment of choice, and it's been used for quite a long time now, but it's just in the last five years or so that now it's standard of care. 
wow. even though the research yeah. started, you know, 30 years ago in Australia with Dr. Tom Barati. So that's something, but I'm also starting to be really excited about what happens if we do these fecal transplants in autistic children mm. or in people with mental health issues, or we know that the microbiome uh, coordinates weight and obesity. We don't have research yet. And in fact, I was talking to Mark Davis, who is a naturopathic physician in Maryland who teaches for us at MUIH. And he also is an expert in um, fecal transplants. And he said, you know, I wish I could say that when I give somebody a fecal transplant and they're obese and they get it from somebody who's thin, that they start losing weight, but they don't. Hmm. So there's a mystery there and we need to kind of unravel that mystery. But I think in the future, we're going to be able to have fecal transplant therapies that get targeted for various health issues based on the composition of the recipient's microbiome and also the donor's microbiome. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I think that we're also going to start seeing probiotics and we're seeing them already. Probiotics that are targeted for weight loss or mental health or, mm -hmm. or bladder infections or ongoing diarrhea. We're already starting to see those coming out on the market because we're starting to get more research. What I want to say is that if you have research that indicates that certain probiotics are going to work, they're still not going to work on everyone. And so there's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of competition in this area and a lot of discovery in these areas that just hasn't been done yet. And, uh, you know, what's going to work for one person isn't going to work for the next person. So it's, right. it's a pretty exciting time. And then personally, I've done, let's see, four one, two, three, four, five uh, microbiome tests on my own body. Oh, and that's so it's fascinating. fascinating. Yes, and I've done them with four different companies, and it's interesting to see what you find. And again, I think that this is all in its infancy, but fascinating to kind of see. And, you know, one of the things I discovered about my own microbiome um, based on uh, some things that go on in my own health, which is unique, that that um, sorry about that. My phone is going off here. Oh, this okay. happens. People are you're on call apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so um, but anyway, some of the things that I found that were interesting about my own microbiome is that is that um, I have a very different kind of microbial community than the one that's described in the literature. And despite hmm. that, I have relatively really good health. And hmm. so, it, you know, when you look at the composition of my microbiome, it looks a little peculiar. But when you look at the function of those microbes, which is to produce energy and to, to have immune functions and to... Uh, keep my met metabolism in balance they're do and make vitamins and do all these things they're doing a pretty good job of all those things so it's fascinating to see how much we don't really know yet that's so I would love to see your little test results that's so cool <laughs> and you know what I think is interesting what you said is that you know we can look at tests but then we also have to look at the person and what's happening, right? Because we don't want to confuse a test result with thinking, well, now there's something wrong with you, right? Like maybe you actually feel pretty good. So we don't want to mess up that part. And that's what the functional medicine, the integrative, you know, approach to this really, I think is, um, it's fun. is because you're really looking at the whole person instead of just one marker and one test result. But um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to, you know, ask you a little bit of a personal question there too. So you talked about your microbiome, but what does Liz Lipsky like to eat on a daily basis? Like what are some of your favorite <laughs> microbiome replenishing foods? And do you have any guilty pleasures over there? <laughs> because I know, you know, where you are, you have a lot of good resources. I'm very jealous of, you know, you're in the area probably has so many great things, um, you know, out in the West coast. 
so what did you have? What did you have for breakfast today? <laughs> well, today was a really bad day because I kind of sure. ran out the door to go on a good out. day. On, on a, a good on day. Most, most days, I'll usually start my morning with a protein smoothie. Yeah. And um, this morning, I had some rice cakes with with some almond butter and some homemade um, blackberry sauce that I Ooh. made. And uh, I just had a little salad for lunch. Um, anyway, but but most mornings, I'll really start the day with with a protein smoothie. And I like to make um, cashew kefir, cashew coconut mm, kefir, yum. which is very easy to make. And um, so I'll put some a little bit of that in there with some water. And I throw in um, some frozen Trader Joe's wild blueberries. Mm. Um, and also a hunk of fresh ginger and a hunk of fresh turmeric and some kale or other greens. I might throw a radish or whatever I feel like throwing in there and, um, some cinnamon for helping blood sugar. And, um, and so just kind of throw all those things in there and make a delicious and sometimes odd tasting smoothie. You know, it <laughs> tastes kind of medicinal. Um, I also usually throw in some uh, wheatgrass powder or some other green powder and a blend of fruit and vegetable powder in there as well and some protein powder. Right now I've been using a sprouted brown rice protein powder. So, you know, um, sometimes I'll throw in a couple dates. It just depends on what's going on. So, but, you know, I like to kickstart my day with something that is phytonutrient rich mm -hmm. and has some protein in it. Um, to me, the most important things are really vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. Yes, I always and say that. Yeah. It's just vegetables have so many uh, great properties to them. You know, dinner for me is always some kind of a protein and more vegetables and some kind of a starchy thing, whether that's brown rice or quinoa or a yam or a potato of some sort. Um, you know, and lunch could be really anything. Um, I have right now some water kefir um, cooking on my counter. Sometimes I have kombucha cooking or some Ooh, pickles. Love kombucha. You know, I used to brew my own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really easy to do rather than spending like $3 for a little jar of it. Mm -hmm. You take a couple tea bags and, and I have a cup of sugar and and somebody else's starter or buy one, you know, buy a SCOBY online and you can make a gallon for, mm -hmm. you know, less, half of what it costs to. If that, yeah. Like, yeah, part. half of what it costs to get one little bottle of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that there's some really simple things that people can do. And, you know, when we think about other things that we like, like chocolate, well, chocolate comes from cocoa beans that have been fermented first. Mm -hmm. When we think about coffee, um, what do we do to that coffee? It gets kind of um, roasted and, you know, um, black tea, green tea, they're fermented foods, bread. How do we make bread? We make that with yeast. It's a culture right. of fermented a, food. A real, real bread that's not, you know, 10,000 ingredients on the label, you know, it's kind of like, Sourdough bread probably has three ingredients, you know, really, but then, yeah. right. So it's just getting back to the, the basics does not have to be hard. No. And so that's what this series is really going to talk about and the why behind it. So you really understand more of that research and, you know, from a clinical perspective too, for all of our practitioners out there. So I, like I said, I could just come and stay at your house and eat with you and just learn from you. And I'm going to be doing more of that as I'm, um, you know, taking the health coaching and doing more of the clinical nutrition as a student here at MUIH, as well as a administrator. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And we will put some information about the Balancing the Microbiome uh, course series in the show notes as well as um, the notes for this video. But you can also learn more about uh, Maryland University of Integrative Health at MUIH. So it's www.muih.edu.